Hello and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands in beautiful mono sound. Phil, let's hear how you sound in, in, in one glorious channel. Let me hear it. I am here and you're hearing me from only one speaker. <laughs> I love, why do I love giving you like completely b- terrible prompts, Phil? I'm like, hey, Phil. Uh, because you're a fucking monster. <laughs> hey, Phil, say something funny. Yeah. As um, I sit here burning my Friday night on an early, oh. recording an early show for you, you force me into these mediocrities. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you weren't doing this, Phil would be, um, I don't know, reading a Star Trek novelization or something on Friday night. Something cool. I mean, I'm sure it would be, you know, I'm a Star Wars person. Oh. Are you really? I, I'm not really. I was when I was younger. Yeah. Everyone was when they were younger. And we all grew up and started watching cool things like MMA. <laughs> yeah. 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 On that note, what a card. What a card. <laughs> this is a, I would say a Phantom Menace level UFC card. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, when we were looking back on this, researching it, like, we did briefly run into, uh, the Clark versus Smith card. <laughs> Which made us, which for me at least, made me appreciate that. Yes. Whilst this is bad, it is not the worst. It's not close to that bad. I, I, yeah, I was, uh, I was looking up, you know, researching Miguel Baeza, one of the fighters we'll be talking about. He's taking on the Pons, Santiago Pons and Nibio on this main card. And, uh, I thought, I want to watch this fight with Takashi Sato. Which card was that from? Smith versus Clark. Did anyone, did you remember that had happened when I brought it up, Phil? I mean, I definitely remembered it was a fight. It's, it was really silly. It struck uh, me like it must have been the feeling people with horrible repressed memories experience when, like, they they smell a certain smell and it just triggers that event they haven't thought about in twenty years. Like, I'm sure I watched it. I don't remember anything about it, and rem- and having to remember it was very unnerving. Um. So no, this is not that bad, but it's also not very good. <laughs> Augusto Sakai, Jairzinho Rosenstreich is our main event. If I have, for some reason, avoided talking about it already, um, I don't know. I, I, I get strong classic bad heavyweight main event vibes from this. Frankly, I've said this several times in other places. Uh, the co-main event, Walt Harris versus Marcin Tabora, I'd much rather see that as a main event. Um, mm-hmm. that, that seems like a way more compelling fight. Honestly, so does. Oh, it's gone. There used to be an Alir Latifi fight here, too. Yeah, this this card's been savaged. But also, you don't have to do... Oh, it is. Bozer versus Latifi. But you don't have to do a heavyweight main event, guys. You really don't. You could have made, um... Well... <laughs> I mean, it, it would have to be the Pons by Aza. Yeah. And that one doesn't really feel all that worthy either. It's that kind of card, folks. What are we going to be talking about, Phil? Let's see. Rosenstrike versus Sakai, the main event. Um, we like the Pawns versus Baeza, of course. I think we may also discuss uh, Yusuf Zalal versus Sean Woodson. That's probably my favorite fight on the card. I like Yusuf Zalal. Is it still on it? Uh, I, it says announced bouts. So as far as I know, it's it's still scheduled. Uh, it's just not on the... Uh, actual oh, uh, yeah. card graphic. Um so that one I like. Um uh, that's about it. <laughs> so we'll see where it takes us. Might be a short episode. Uh anyway, let's do the main event. Enough bitching, enough prevaricating Phil. Enough avoiding our fate, our terrible fate. Jarzino Rosen. There's, there's, not, there's not enough bitching. Well we'll get more, I'm sure. <laughs> People who love our more negative episodes will be having a treat with this one. Rosenstroik versus Sakai. What do you make of this fascinating contenders fight? I've been thinking that, like, normally when there's a fighter that one of us really hates, the other one is at least there to yeah, um, to soften, you know, or at least mock. Yeah, that's what uh, I was going to say. At least. <laughs> To like tease, to when tease the other. That fight inevitably wins. Yes. Uh, like, is Rosenstreich one of the rare fights that we both hate? Yeah. Like, 
as yeah. much as each other. You you balance me on Shevchenko. I balance you on Josh Emmett, so on and so forth. You just made me extremely mm-hmm. mad before by comparing Miguel Baeza to Mowgli Benitez. We'll talk about that later. Um, so we have our favorites and our least favorites. I, I do think this is a rare occasion where what is there to like about your Xenia Rosen strike style? What is uh, there he's to... extremely passive. He's extremely passive. And you said before, he's like Shevchenko, like without being good. Without, yeah. without a, an ability to. You don't to... have the grudging appreciation yes. for the technical depth. Not at all. You're just, you're just like, ah. Uh. You know, I think, I think Jack's, I think Jack Slack might also be united with us on this one. I think I saw him on Twitter. He said, all fighters are over, all, all fighters are underpaid apart from Josh and you. <laughs> A classic slacky tweet. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know, man. I think, how can you be an analyst and like someone like Rosenstrike? Not even like Sriram likes Rosenstrike. And he likes all oh, the most boring that is, fighters. That is damning, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he's not even workmanlike. Anyway, let's talk about it. Why do we hate Rosenstrike so much? Uh, cause he's just, in- he's incredibly passive, but he has. Like, like enough defense and power and physical attributes to make that work. Yeah. Uh, he's like, yeah, I mean, there's many people you can compare him to. It's, it's like Derek Lewis. If Derek Lewis, like, wasn't fun in the slightest, <laughs> like, there was no personality <laughs> or, like, entertainment to anything Derek Lewis did. Yeah. He just went through his fight steadily losing and then occasionally knocked someone out with a random punch. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and go on. I think we both kind of still like Augusto Sakai. Yes, because he is someone who is workmanlike and who has built a game that has made sense in its own way. Yeah, he's a classic and... sort of Sriram fighter. Since we mentioned Sriram, he's you know he's unre- un- unremarkable, but he's he's doing a good job. Yeah, um, yeah, he tries to faint. He tries to like throw in combination, he tries to fight at a pace that he can keep and sometimes fails, but you know, he's he's decent in the clinch, he's not particularly good uh as a wrestler, but he's he's sort of fine there from for heavyweight standards. Mm-hmm. He is trying. He is doing his best. And I kind of find myself thinking that this might be one of the styles of fighter that is in fact the most primed to lose to Jazz in your Rosenstrike? Mm. I think there's a uh, chance. Because, uh, yeah, please explain. Because Sakai is basically just going to try and uh, move into boxing range in exchange with Rosenstrike. Uh, he's going to try and outwork him, but you know, as we've we've seen, there are there are several uh, levels of pure physicality in the UFC heavyweight division. Yeah. And going to a split with Andre Olovsky implies yes. that you are on the Andre Olovsky tier. And getting TKO'd by Alistair Overeem puts you underneath the Alistair Overeem tier. And the Alistair Overeem tier comes underneath the Jarzinho Rosenstrike. Um, <sighs> so the, the main, uh, the issue is like, just thinking of the fight that determined that Rosenstrike is above <laughs> Overeem. <laughs> Yeah. Another horrific heavyweight memory. Anyway, go on. Oh, absolutely awful. Um, Not even the finish. I'm talking about the four and a half rounds up to the finish. <laughs> yeah. Abysmal. Oh, yeah, the whole thing. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Sakai is going to be trying to force uh, Rosenstrike into, like, his, his win position is basically pushing people up into the cage and landing combinations on them. And... Rosenstrokes is basically being pushed into the cage and counterpunching people harder than they hit him. Yes. And he can do that. Uh, and Sakai doesn't really seem to have any places that he can be safe. You know, uh, with, Ro- with Overeem, it was mostly, uh, in the wrestling. And with Garn, it was obviously just from distance because, you know, Rosenstroke was just going to stare at Garn whilst he got kicked. Um, but you know, how does Sakai stay safe? I just, I just can't see it. And it makes me sad. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I almost took. I, I almost made the mistake. I think of. I, I, I think you're you're very much on the ball, um, Phil. I, I almost made the mistake of thinking that because Sakai went to split decisions with the two other counterpunchers he's faced in the UFC, them being the aforementioned Andre Arlovsky and uh, uh, Blago Ivanov, another heavy, heavyweight I really like actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought you know maybe. That's a good sign. He's actually winning. They're close fights. They're split decisions. I know it's, and then Rosenstruck is going to draw a split style fight out of so many different heavyweights, but he won them. But I don't know. Watching it, I think, you know, as this is, this is the worst thing about Rosenstruck is that he is physically adept enough to make his atrocious style functional. Mm-hmm. He's really fast and really powerful. He instant, you know. I mean, just look at for for MMA math. Just look at their their different fights against Andre Arlovsky. Right, exactly. He wiped him out instantaneously in one exchange. Yeah. Um, and, and Sakai, you know, he had the quick knockout against Tabora, but he just doesn't really do that. That's a very uncommon uh, type of finish for him to score. It's usually attritive, again, workmanlike, and he's not fast. And he was like several steps lower than Andre Arlovsky in terms of pure speed. Um, it was really just like his approach to fighting was a little more sensible. I think that earned him the split, but even then it was a split and a, a deserved one. It was a very close fight. And I just, yeah, I just watch him like plodding into range, pumping out that jab and just getting cracked with a huge right hook. Um, mm-hmm. that's what I see. He's not enough of a kicker like gone. He faints, but again, it's a little mechanical sometimes. Um, and like the shots that the faints are supposed to be setting up are again, slow <laughs> and on a really predictable sort of tempo. And, um, you know, you mentioned putting people against the cage. That would obviously be the way to beat Rosenstrike. Uh, you know, do a, do a slow, steady version of what Nganu did. <laughs> you, you know, a much slower, much steadier yes. version <laughs> of what Nganu did. Uh, you know, a guy like Rosenstrike can be nuked against the cage, but he's not even a particularly good cage cutter. Augusto Sakai. Um, in fact, he's pretty bad at it. He, he, he focuses much more on position relative to the opponent rather than, uh, cage generalship, as it were. And so I don't even know that he can consistently back rows and strike up against the cage. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I find, I, I find interesting is that, uh, is that Rosenstrike, when he backs up, uh, Sakai does tend to close into the clinch a lot when he, when he strikes. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, I expect Rosenstruck to just be physically more powerful than him. But I'm interested to see if Sakai can just, like, rather than particularly using his entries to set up strikes, whether he can just clash into the into the clinch and just dirty box and work from there. Um, it, this is one of those weird fights where I'm, I think, I'm actually rooting for it to be uh, an ugly slog, because I think that's how Sakai wins it. I think a UFC friendly hi- highlight reel is how uh, Rosenstroke wins it. Uh but unfortunately I think that's probably uh it's probably what's going to happen and probably why they booked it. You don't think Jarzin or Rosenstroke can win a slog, Phil? I mean he can. He's done it before. It, honestly, it being Rosenstroke, you'll probably get the worst of both worlds. You'll probably get a five round <laughs> slog. <laughs> punctuated at the very end by a highlight reel knockout yeah he that is exactly the kind of thing he would like to do to us <laughs> he was put on this earth to test us and he's very good at it um yeah i i guess the, the only other thing to mention is like this is the opportunity for sakai who who may be trying to mix things up because he just got uh you know he got slept in his last fight didn't he yeah over him. Yeah, I mean, it was a really brutal fight where he just steadily gave up more and more ground and pound to Overeem before he got right, like finished. And so, 
um, specifically the kind of fight, you know, just getting grounded to a paste where he might want to invest, might have invested in his wrestling. That would be a very good idea here against Rosenstrike. Rosenstrike is basically a non-entity on the ground. Um, anyone who takes him down, like whenever Overeem took him down, he doesn't have the greatest takedown defense in the world. Honestly, he's, uh, he can get out positioned in the cage. He gives up underhooks. He really, really relies on his athleticism in that department in particular. And, uh, when he does go down, he just kind of lays flat in his back and does literally nothing. Even by heavyweight standards, he's pretty poor on the ground. So maybe yeah. if Sakai comes in having bolstered that aspect of his game, then they get the whole the whole crashing into clinches element could really really work to his favor. As it is, I I don't really see him winning a fight just grinding Rosenstrike against the cage. Like a, even in that kind of engagement, you're still going to have to break, and then Rosenstrike's going to try to hit you. <laughs> I I just and he's still stronger, I think, in the clinch Rosenstrike and. Mm-hmm. And I can see his stockiness working to his advantage. I, I don't know. I just I don't see that being a very reliable path to victory for Sakai unless he has upped his takedown ability, which, as you said at the start yeah. of the show, has not been that impressive in the past. The other thing is that you know when is that uh, you know ju- just the relative physicality you could see in the Overeem and Sakai fights is that Overeem. Uh, Overeem knackered himself taking down Rosenstroke multiple times. Right. And he knackered Sakai taking him down multiple times. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, just the physicality just makes any potential path to, um, like a victory very tough for, for Sakai, I think. You know, I think this, this one seems less competitive the more I look at it. Yeah. And again, I think that's why they booked it. Ooh. Why do you think that? Do they want? Because they just uh, like they they like heavyweights who knock people out, and they never pay any attention to anything else that they do. God, I guess all they care about is like the ten seconds that gets on ESPN. Huh? I mean, think about how many <laughs> main event slots and how much uh, money. They have paid Andre Olovsky in comparison to like almost any other UFC fighter on the roster. <laughs> Overeem too. I mean, and, up until very recently, was in that category. Yeah, but I mean, Overeem at least has been has finished people. Well, true. How many people has Andre Olovsky <laughs> finished in recent memory? Yeah, I don't. Let know. me actually look that up. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, he got taps, uh, he won decision, 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 no contest, decision. It had to have been Travis Brown. He got TKO'd. Yeah, Travis Brown was the last person he knocked out in May 2015. (laughs) I love Arlovsky, though. There's something I appreciate and respect about Andre Arlovsky. Oh, yeah. Still doing it. You know, he used to be a way more exciting fighter than Rosenstrike. And now he has no choice. Rosenstrike could be anything he wanted to be. And this is what he has chosen. We're not mad, we're just disappointed. That's right. <laughs> Jairzinho, we believed in you. Well, I didn't, actually, but your mother did. All right, that's it. We're both picking Rosenstrike, I think, with heavy hearts and heavy heads. I can feel myself drifting off already. It's, it's, I, I think it'll likely be a brutal fight either way. Um, yep. and not in the way we like. So, okay. Yeah. yeah, there's a solid chance that Sakai, like, wins the first round. Sure. Rosenstruck just doesn't do anything. Yeah. But against someone who just does nothing but give opportunities. I mean, what's he gonna do? He's gotta, he's gotta accidentally hit Sakai at some point. All right, um, let's take a break then. We can we can finally put this one behind us. The rest of the card is significantly more interesting, which isn't saying a whole lot considering the main event we just discussed. But um, again, it could be Smith versus Clark. So let's uh, let's count our blessings, and uh, those blessings will be named: Walt Harris versus Marcin Tabora. Um, I th- we might talk about Tanner Bozer, Alir Latifi, Ponzinibbio Baeza. 
I mean, I, we're not going to talk about all these, are we, Phil? Or are we going to run through them? Uh, let's see what we get through. Okay. Well, you'll see what happens after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands, still in glorious mono audio. Uh, I'll try to have that sorted out by next week, folks, if things sound a little weird to you. Just a recording um, issue. I didn't explain that earlier. Just pointed it out. Walt Harris versus Marching Tabora, Phil. The co-main event. Uh, a fight I very much wish were the main event. I think a far more interesting dynamic at the very least. You have two clearly defined styles with their, their strengths and their, this being heavyweight, their oh so obvious flaws. Um. Yeah, but from a booking perspective. Yeah. Can, you can also see why, because think not to spoil anything, but the main event, the basic dynamic is big punch man. Probably going to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that's the dynamic for this one. Big Punch Man may win. May win. He, he always may win. He always may win. <laughs> I mean, Marching Tabora, as uh, we mentioned in segment one, managed to make Augusto Sakai look like Big Punch Man. So there is mm. always a chance. Um, for a guy like Walt Harris. But yeah, I don't know. I just like this dynamic. This is like, you know, stories are about conflict, Phil. And when I'm watching my stories, I want a good conflict. And this one, these two fighters have clearly opposite goals. It may not yield, as you kind of suggested, a particularly exciting fight. Um, especially if Walt Harris doesn't win. But I kind of like watching Marcin Tabora do his like bizarre, uh, picking apart of uh, exhausted, more powerful fighters. I certainly enjoyed watching him do it to Greg Hardy anyway. Yeah, that, that was very satisfying. This, of course, will not be nearly as satisfying if he gets the same kind of win, which if he does win, it seems like it'll look pretty similar to that. Uh, but Walt Harris, obviously a far more likable and sympathetic character than the heinous Greg Hardy. Um, what do you make of it? Do you have a, a leaning which one way or the other? Uh, the one thing I was thinking is, is Marcin Tabura in his prime right now? Mm-hmm. 35, that sounds like a heavyweight prime. Yeah, it kind of, he kind of seems to be. Mm-hmm. And all of those those performances in that kind of four-fight win streak have been reasonably impressive in one way or another. They're good wins, honestly. Yeah, I mean... Uh, some of some of those some of those wins have honestly aged better than you might you might have expected. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't really think much of Sergey Spivak, but he's actually pretty decent. He is. Uh, and if I was expecting uh, Tibor to be able to beat Ben Rothwell, don't know if it would have necessarily been in a super high pace uh, like war. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, you know, because he's tended to sort of lose those fights before when he hasn't been able to get significant top position on people. Mm-hmm. He's just been stuck on the feet. Uh, but yeah, he also, you know, made Greg Hardy look as bad as Greg Hardy is. Mm-hmm. I, honestly, he made the best ever by far version of Greg Hardy look bad, which was significant. Mm-hmm. He, he, he put on like a real like veteran kind of performance there to beat Hardy. And Maxim yeah, Grishin, he's... the uh, second guy in his streak, also, I thought, uh, now moved down to light heavyweight, I'm pretty sure. He had a, a great fight with Ju- Dustin Jacoby that I really enjoyed. Um, I think that win has aged relatively well, too. I mean, it didn't even need to age well. Grishin came in with like a, as a pretty credentialed heavyweight. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good looking uh, list of meaningful wins for Marcin Tabor. I think I agree. It does feel like the prime of a man's career. 
you know who I feel like he's he's kind of evolved into. Hmm. Don't hate me because I'm comparing him to someone that you like. I will, but go um, on. He's kind of, I mean, not just for the physical resemblance. He really is looking more like Nicholas Dalby than ever in the way that he fights. Oh yeah, no, I can get, I can see that. Yeah. But before he was very much. It's weird. They've kind of gone in opposite directions. Dalby has moved away from exchanging and being more into, leaned more into just being like a weird range kicker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, Tibra has moved like the other way. Yeah. Uh, just like really leaning on his, uh, on his, on his hands a lot more than he did. Not because he's any kind of puncher, but just because he's getting more used to an exchanges and can stay busy and can like, as I said, and could, can beat someone like Ben Rothwell. Yeah, honestly, the the comfort the comfort he did show in exchanges, and it took a, it still took still took a few seconds of getting there, a few seconds of getting bombed um, against Greg Hardy, was I think mm-hmm. like the, by far the best he's ever looked in that range in his career by far, because he has historically been really really uncomfortable <laughs> in punching exchanges. He's got. You know, he, he went into that fight. He still had all the, the marching Tabura like ticks. He still had the, like his, def- his def- uh, defense is pretty much amounts to raising up a guard on one side really, really high, like a classic, uh, earmuff, yeah. answer the phone kind of blocking. Um, while the other hand is like drifting at his nipple, you know, like it requires him to be completely aware. Yeah, of, he, he's got a big kind of lean and flail Daniel Cormier thing going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. It, it requires him to really be on top of where the punch is coming from. And it, it also really benefits from an opponent with a predictable sort of right left kind of punching attack. Uh, but you know, like he actually relied on those things and he used them to create counter punching opportunities. And to swarm the, the, the bigger hitter who was trying to hit him, he, he used that defense proactively. And that is something I have rarely seen from Tabura in his career. Usually his response to a big puncher coming at him was like, run away, run away and kick, run away and kick. Whenever you can get the clinch, get the clinch. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he, he hung out in the pocket and actually did some good work there. And he did the clinching and he ran away and did some kicking. I liked it a lot. So I think it'll work against Walt Harris. Uh, with the caveat being that, as almost happened against Greg Hardy, he might just get slept in the first minute. Tabora, that is. Yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. Walt Harris has to be one of the biggest, he- like, glass cannons in mm-hmm. any division. Mm-hmm. Because he's never visibly improved his takedown defense at all. Nope. Or his grappling. Nope. And... And yet remains extremely dangerous. And you know, you could pick him against people like uh, uh, Alexei Alinek, who's generally, you know, his his mo is going to be survive until you can grapple and then destroy them. And you're like, yeah, sure, that that'll happen if you can grapple with him. But you won't be able to grapple with him. Yep. You're going to get your head taken off. And children, sure enough, that is what happened. Spivak is a, essentially the same fighter, and Harris had the exact same fortune, fortunate uh, experience against him where he knocked him out before the the realization that Spivak could out-wrestle him settled on him. Yep. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, there's, uh, you know, uh, none of none of what we've said... Uh, has been like, oh yeah, Marching Tibera is, uh, super hard to hit. No. So, it's still gonna be a, nor is he like a super explosive, like, wrestler who's just gonna cover the distance in the blink of an eye and get into the clinch. So, he's gonna have a lot of shaky moments, but he is a good wrestler. Mm, yeah. Is he? I mean, well, it's heavyweight. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, you know, sort of, uh, like, he's like Nicholas Delby. He's an enthusiastic wrestler. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think that's... That's generally enough. Yeah, that's that's generally enough. It's certainly against Walt Harris. I mean, gr- granted, again, the Spivak fight is the one that really worries me. If there is a fighter in this division who is a pretty good parallel to Tabora, it's probably Spivak. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, Harris just like, he, he knows what he needs to do in the first minute. He will put pressure on his opponent. Spivak allowed himself to get backed into the cage in that fight. Um, Harris came in with some feints and then, you know, a ferocious combination. It doesn't really matter how good, uh, Tabora's 
eyes might be or how much improved they might, his vision might be if he's, um, you know, the other guy's hitting him really, really fast. <laughs> I don't think you can like alternately raise one hand to your ear and drop the other to your hip back and forth as fast as Walt Harris can punch you with right then left. Um, but yeah, I, I trust Tabora. I think he's got better footwork than Spivak by a good stretch. I think he will be very aware he needs to stay off the fence. And once Walt Harris kind of burns himself out after a minute and a half, uh, the wrestling will become a factor as well. So yeah, I, it's a good one. Like I said, interesting dynamic. Um, if Tabora wins, it could end up being a bit of a slog. But, uh, you know, honestly, like that, that is kind of the, the blessing of Walt Harris is that he really is a glass cannon. Like people don't tend to turn the fight around on him and then still have to drag him to the decision. You know, you turn it, you turn it around and he's out of there kind of quickly most of the time. So maybe even, yep. maybe even Tabora can do that. All right. Uh, what next? Um, Boy, Roman. Also, the other thing worth noting is that Harris looked absolutely a terrible against Volkov. Yeah. If there's, you know, any kind of trend going on between these two, it's definitely like yeah. Tibra up, Harris down. For sure. It definitely looked like he had, I mean, he put so much stock into the, that Overeem fight. Like it really ripped my heart out. His, his, his daughter had just passed away. Mm-hmm. They were talking about it constantly on the broadcast. Um, which I gathered he was okay with, but it still felt uncomfortable. Yep. Um, and then he just gets smashed by an old man. Like it's such a heavyweight result. And it, it really felt like he came into the Volkov fight a little over it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what he looks like. Speaking of fighters who might be a little over it, Santiago Ponzinibbio is taking on Miguel Baeza, aka Big Dumb Mowgli. Um, we don't trust Pons anymore. Lou, if you will. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Lou, if you will. Big Dumb Mowgli, Lou. I don't think I get it. Lou is the large bear who. In the Jungle Book. Mowgli oh, is the, Baloo. Oh, oh, oh. Is the, I just heard Lou. <laughs> I was uh, like, sorry. who the fuck is I've Lou? I've the connection <laughs> dropping out for a sec. <laughs> yes, Baloo. I like that. That works. Um, so, Santiago Ponzinibbio. We don't trust him anymore. Um, there's no reason to trust him anymore. He has looked really quite bad uh, ever since the fight with... It's only one fight. That's the thing. I guess that's true. One fight, but it's a, it's like a two and a half year gap. No, he, that. he looked bad against Magni too. Didn't, Didn't he? he wiped him out? Oh, you're right. Like, why do I think it has to have been more of a stretch? Why do I feel like I don't trust him so much? Cause I mean, he was, he was gone for ages and then he looked like absolute trash. Oh, that's, it was a three year gap between those fights. Of course. Uh, yeah. He just, but, but why did it happen? What's going on with Ponzinibbio? He came back and suddenly was like terrified, visibly terrified of being countered. Mm -hmm. Really unusual. Ponzinibbio has always been like perfectly willing to stand right on the edge of the fire. Um, would, 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 you know, jab one, two his way into the pocket, take an angle, get just out of range, even stay in range and continue exchanging. And then against the leech, it was like, he, he, he could tell by everything in, in, uh, Leech's body language that he was looking to counter him. And he did exactly the wrong thing, which was to, mm-hmm. to sort of edge just outside of the edge of range and then sort of, you know, hesitantly throw single strikes. Really, really bad. Um, he, 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 his, his wariness of the counter ended up inviting a counter that knocked him out. It was a really bad look after such a long layoff. Yeah, because he's been, you know, historically, well, prime, prime Pons has been someone with overwhelming offense and, yeah, not much in the other, not much, not much defense, but like a big diffuser for people who want to uh, be on the, you know, being on the back foot has historically been kind of suicidal against him. Because he does things that that MMA fighters aren't ready for, like on one twos. <laughs> He's a big 
person for stepping in behind the jab and mm-hmm. then just dropping the right hand on people. Uh, I didn't really do any of that against the leech because he he just yeah he didn't want to step in unless he was in the process of throwing his big punch already, which obviously got him knocked out in short order. Yeah, it was a really um, immature sort of thought process for such a like experienced, consistent fighter. That was the thing. That was the way you would expect um, a novice to react to to, to the threat of counter punching. Which I guess, and, you know, this is someone who knocked out Nelson, who is a right, very good single strike counter puncher who <laughs> maintains distance and so on. And uh, yeah, and, and if uh, I have no doubt, if if Ponzinibbio had tried that same approach against Gunnar Nelson, he would have got knocked the fuck out. Yeah, Nordine Taleb too. Maybe even Zach Cummings would have been a harder opponent uh, as a counter puncher if he had had that approach. Cummings probably would have caught him with some big shots. It's really just exactly the wrong approach and very uncharacteristic for Ponzinibbio, which almost screams ring rust more than anything. Mm-hmm. But maybe also screams like, oops, you missed your prime. And now it's gone. Yeah. Like, he, he's, I mean, he's not that old, but he's still, what, 13 years into his MMA career? Yep. Uh, and yeah, just like two and a half years of injuries. I think it was yeah. Um, I think it was staff that he had. It, it was yes. He had a really bad case of staff. But yeah, so uh, Baeza is again like pretty much someone I would probably pick Ponzinibbio to beat quite easily if I right. thought Ponzinibbio existed because he's a straight upright counter puncher. Uh, like doesn't move his head much. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I, I, I compared him to, um, I compared him to uh, Benitez because he's a really weird, really weird fighter in that he has like classic southpaws game. He, he's not a southpaw, right? Uh, he, he he like runs his his right hand right kick mix up like a lot, uh, and yeah, just generally. Looks like the classic Southpaw counterpuncher, except that he's doing it against orthodox people most of the time. But mm-hmm. as you know, in that in that note, actually looked pretty good against it when he when he was doing it against the Southpaw because he kicked Sato in the body a whole bunch and forced him to chase and such like. But yeah, so I would expect you know what something to, what to happen to Bizer is, is what happened to him briefly against Matt Brown is that he would get pushed into the cage by uh, Ponzinibbio, who would then like. One one to him and knock him out or mm-hmm. kick his leg off, as much as he did to like Neil Magny and or Gunnar Nelson. Um, but I, I don't I don't trust Ponsonifio to do that anymore. Yeah, nor do I. Um, so is it, is it just the? I'm still hung up on this, Phil. Is it, is it just the 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 the, the South Pauliness of his game that makes you think of Benitez? And and just the general like stance. Yeah, Benitez like does have he's, head movement, you know. He's like a. I, I think like Baza is someone I'm I'm interested in. I think I agree. Because he's, he's he he looks he he's a strange fighter because he looks almost complete in terms of what he wants to do doesn't seem to be trying much more in the cage, at least partially because he has a lot of success with it, but he's not very experienced. He's only five years into his MMA career. Mm-hmm. So he's one of those weird guys where, like, uh, rather than... Like, he's clearly very talented, but rather than trying to load in tons of complexity from an early age, he's just sat on a relatively simple game plan and tried to develop it out. Uh, like or tried to make it as functional as possible as soon as possible. Right. But I'm interested to see like what kind of direction he improves in. I suspect that he might just continue being basically the same guy. Uh but he is he is already like pretty good. He is pretty good. He's I mean he's got some some athleticism working for him. Mm-hmm. Um he seems to have big power. He's I mean, I don't think he's, he's, he's not a very, uh, he's not particularly fast handed. Honestly, I think it's more that he, he knows he has power and he loads up too much. 
I think he could look significantly faster with a little more experience under his belt if he just settles down and just, you know, throws the punches out there. Um, but he's pretty agile for a guy his size. He's not a particularly small welterweight. Um, and certainly has, you know, like the recoverability. We saw that against Matt Brown. Maybe youth was to blame for him winning that fight, but he, he did absolutely, uh, survive a really scary moment in the cage and come back to win. Um, yeah. And, so yeah, I, you I, know, I, he's, he, he's not someone who's been wiping everyone out in one round, mm-hmm. which, it, it does. It does generally speak to someone who is figuring their opponents out a mm-hmm. bit more. Mm-hmm. He's got three straight second round finishes in in the UFC. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's got some composure and some skill. And you know, submitting Takashi Sato is not an easy thing to do. He's got he's got decent skill everywhere. So I, like, it, it's interesting because, as I said, it's a strange one of these strange situations where he's. So functional already, I'm, I somewhat worry that he just won't build out. He'll just be like, well, I can just yeah. right hand and right kick and occasionally grapple with everyone. And that's the tough uh, thing about this fight is that this is like the, it seems like the perfect opportunity for him to not learn anything new. Yeah, it's very much dependent on what, on what kind of pawns he gets. Yeah, right. If, if Pons comes back and it was ring rust, which I really hope it was, I yep. would love to see just a few more like, tail end of the prime Pons and Nibio fights, um, then Baez is going to have a really hard time. He, he's, he, mm. he, he counter kicks far too much for my liking. I'd never like when people get backed up into the cage and their first instinct is to throw like a right low kick. It's just not a good idea. Not off the, off the back foot like that. Certainly not when you're cornered. Um, Pons and Nibio can absolutely strafe you with one twos if you try that kind of stuff. Um, Pons Nibio is a good fainter. He is good at moving around his opponent, um, off of feints and like the initial steps. He could absolutely draw out that relatively predictable counter right hand. You know, predictable because it's almost all by as it throws and it's not as fast as it could be. Like I said, Pons Nibio could have a field day, um, forcing that out and then countering it. But I don't trust Pons Nibio. I almost don't want to render a pick because it feels like. <laughs> It's like, I just don't know how Santiago is going to look. But, uh, based on that Lee Jing Leong fight, I'm going to take a flyer, I guess, and say Baeza. I really hope it's Pons and Nibio comes in looking even marginally refreshed, though. I think he would win if that were the case. Yeah. It's a, it's a strange one. And that would be um, the best outcome as well, because again, Baeza would, would, ha- would perhaps have to address that at the perfect point in his career where he can make a, a few dramatic changes. And I think that could yeah. it could be part of what makes him a really good fighter down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll take I'll take the pawns just on the case, just on the on the offshoot that he does actually turn up, right? Because, uh, like, one of the re, you know one of the things that does characterize the people that Baez has been up against is that they're not like super dynamic finishes. I mean, Matt Brown isn't really that anymore. Right. Because he's 100 years old. Yeah. Uh, and he still put him in trouble. So if, if Pons is, is there, and if he doesn't wipe Pons out and he gets some confidence going, he can, if he, if, if, if Pons can back him into the cage the same way Matt Brown did, I, I do think he will probably, he will probably knock him out. Do a classic. I'll take Pons to finish him just on a on a fly, but yeah, I'm I'm very very concerned. Classic eye poke to right hand against the fence. You can do oh, it. Oh yeah, you can do it, Pons. Um. All right, let's take a break then. Uh, that one is genuinely, I think, an interesting fight. If if for like somewhat tragic reasons. Um. But yeah, an interesting fight, potentially a crossroads kind of fight, a passing of the torch. Uh. After this, we've got a couple other fights in the card that are not like that. Uh, well, I don't know. I like Tanner Bozer earlier on TV in a really weird way. I also like Yusuf as a lol versus Sean Woodson. Listeners of the show will know Woodson is one of my guys. You know, if I'm Mark Marin, then Sean Woodson is my guy. And, um, I like Yusuf as a lol as well. So we'll talk about those. Maybe something else. We'll see. Probably not after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. 
perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are talking, um, are we talking heavyweights first, Phil, or are we talking uh, Woodson's Alal? I think Woodson's Alal is a better fight. Let's talk about that. Um, yeah, let's go for it. Yep, don't know where this one is situated on the card as of yet. It's still under the announced about section on Wikipedia. It probably is updated somewhere else, and I just haven't looked, but that's fine. For this card, that'll do. <laughs> um, I like this fight. It is a, it's a, it's a really interesting style clash. It is more importantly than that, um, because I'm a, an emotional creature and everything I, everything I do is based purely on how it makes me feel. Um, I like both these guys. You know, um, Sean Woodson, of course. It, Sean Woodson is just really, really fucking good for his age and experience. He came into the, the UFC, I think six and oh, and, mm-hmm. um, and fought Kyle Bokniak and basically did twice as good as the beat Magomed Sharipov did against Kyle Bokniak. And then he had to fight Julian Arosa and that didn't work out. Um, a classic sort of prospect loss too passive, too willing to let himself get put against the cage or rather not passive at all. He's a, he's a very high output fighter. It was really that positionally he, he, he was, he didn't realize how much he needed to push back against the pressure or how much more active he needed to be with his footwork. He has a sort of style where he'll move and adjust constantly, but, um, not urgently, if that makes sense constant little small pivots and adjustment steps so that he's always in position to throw back. And normally I would say that's great. But uh, when you're fighting a guy who has the approach Julian Arosa brought to the table in that fight, intense pressure, high volume blended with the wrestling. Sometimes you need to just get out of out from in front of him. Um, And and that's the kind of stuff that Woodson is not necessarily very good at. Yusuf Zalal, I've had a roller coaster experience with him as a UFC fighter. I didn't think he looked particularly good when he came to the UFC and then he won in a four fight streak. None of these, um, are like particularly great wins, but they were still good performances. Zalal has a really a functional, professional sort of style out fighter with wrestling. He's like Enrique Barzola, sort of, uh, an outfighter mm-hmm. who, who does counter shots and, um, he was making that work really well for a little while, and now he's lost two in a row. Woodson lost his last fight. It seems almost a little unfair, a little cruel, but uh, it is, after all, combat sports, and uh, I quite like this fight. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, it's a, it's a really weird one. Because... Um, everything that Everything that one guy has the advantage in, you can sort of... Or at least every flaw that the one guy has, you can sort of counter it with one from the other one. Yeah. Like Zalal has an an obvious speed edge. Yep. Then, um, and I, we saw in his last fight that that he's he he also just he he wants to be safe the whole time. Right. He's kind of the opposite and, of Woodson. Woodson always wants to hang in. You know, and, 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 and defend himself in range so he can hit you back. Is yeah. It... As you mentioned, like, Zalal's a phase shifter. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see that obviously troubling, um, troubling Woodson. Mm-hmm. But, uh, does he, can he just maintain the, the pace that he needs? Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, and, you know, Woodson basically. Uh, I, I would generally look on Zalal as being kind of the more the more fragile fighter, mm-hmm. but uh, Julian and Rosa is not really someone I would classify as like a finisher. No, and granted, it was an uncharacteristically violent, determined Julian Arosa. I think in that fight, I think Julian Arosa mm-hmm. was like, "I am not going to be fucking John Alessio. I'm not going to keep yep. getting UFC shots and never win one of them." Here's a six and O guy. 
I have 28 fights on my record or whatever it is. I have to beat him. I think it was an unusually determined Juliana Rosa, which is saying something because the guy does always bring it to a degree. Um, but he was yeah out for blood that night. But yeah, I mean, I think in general, my thoughts are that Zalal, he wants to, he wants to be a slick star. That's what I, the, the impression I get watching him that he wants to be like, he wants to fight perfectly land shots from the outside and be safe and then right. just take people down and be safe. And he's, he's, he wants to be like slick as he's fighting. Right. And he's going to be having that kind of, that kind of fight, you know, one where he's either all the way in or all the way out. His problem with being all the way out is that, uh, Sean Woodson is a giant freak looking person. Yeah. Can just box him up from that range. And his, you know, being all the way in. Kyle Bogniak's pretty good at that. Mm hmm. And he didn't get much done against Sean Woodson at all. Mm hmm. Uh, so I do favor, I do favor Woodson. Uh, unless Zalal can, you know, I think Zalal is going to have to, because he's, he is someone who is willing to attack the body. Um, but like not in any kind of sustained way. And think, you know, I think that, that Sung Lu Choi fight was kind of damning to be honest. Yeah. Cause he was clearly sort of forced into a losing pattern. Right. And couldn't really find a way out of it. Yeah. It wasn't exactly encouraging. I, I don't consider Woodson's loss to be as discouraging as something like that. Woodson's loss is like, oh, this is, this has to happen at some point. Um, it was a prospect loss, including the, you know, surprising submission finish that I think it was a, a, a Darce that was locked on standing. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah. It was a super cool fight. It was an amazing fight. Fantastic. And if you haven't watched it, absolutely go and watch it right now. It really is a banger. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think the, the thing for me is, is I'm, I'm curious about how like directionality works in this matchup because, mm. Zalal's, I, I think you're totally right. Zalal is a, he is a, he's a safety first fighter. And I don't even mean that in a bad way. He's not even a boring fighter. Um, no. he's just, his, his goal is to, yeah, doing things correctly for him means not giving your opponent chances, um, unduly. And Sean Woodson is totally the opposite of that. He is also, he's a different kind of slickster. He also wants to be slick, but, um, he will invite you to test his slickness. He is not trying to outmaneuver you. And so I wonder if that, what that attitude, um, means in a fight where, I mean, what we're looking at here is a matchup with two guys who are generally on the back foot. Um, not really because they're like pure counterpunchers per se, but they're, they're more, I don't know, uh, I guess Woodson is, but he's a high output counterpuncher and Zalal is, uh, really a classic outfighter type. Um, yeah, I, Woodson does apparently have a very extensive, uh, like amateur boxing and oh, like yeah. smoker match. You can see that. Uh, that, that guy has well, done boxing for sure. Yeah. Uh, he actually like has a nice defense. <laughs> very rare. He will go in there. He can, he can actually hit shoulder rolls and counter off of them. He has a really nice sort of shell defense. Um, and it all, I love how it like interchangeably interlockable all the pieces of his defense are, uh, you know, you can, you can pull and then slip and then there's a pivot. He doesn't get stuck in one place, just relying on the upper body move, uh, defense, the, the, the guard and the, and the head movement. He alternates that with the footwork and with the counter punching really, really pleasing to the eye. Um, I sus- so in, in a um, mm-hmm. UFC interview, he said that he had his first boxing match at eight years old. That sounds about right. Mm, I wonder weird. how wonder how tall he was. <laughs> yeah, he must have been huge. Um, so I I look at these two guys and I and I, and I wonder who's who's going to come forward. I think, based on what you're saying, I kind of suspect Zalal because he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to expose himself to risk, and Woodson has massive reach. Um, and walking in on that has got to feel very risky. 
Although sort of in a counterintuitive way, it might be the safest thing to do. Just get in there and try to wrestle Woodson. But uh, also, Woodson really does let his opponents bring the fight to him most of the time. That's the kind of fight he enjoys. So I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, Woodson's huge, and I think he's got uh, just a sort of a higher ceiling. Zalal I really like, but his game is, um, again, like Enrique Barzola, his game is a little shallow. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, he succeeds because he knows exactly why he's trying to do everything. He will hit the round ceiling takedowns. He will just stay, stay just ahead of you on punch output. Um, and he will constantly make you chase him and miss. But if something goes wrong, I'm not really sure. In fact, I'm quite sure he's not a very good adjuster. Um, he will just kind of stick with doing whatever is not working without changing anything up. And so what I would like to see is a, a, a between fights adjustment from Zala. I would like to see him bring something more to the table to deepen his game. As it is, I assume Woodson's pocket is about 10 feet wider than Zalal's and he's going to beat Zalal whenever they're in that range. So I'm picking him. Yeah. I mean, it is just like, I think Zalal is a, he's a cleaner a cleaner striker than Bokniak, but mm-hmm. you could beat Woodson just by being like a determined he's shifter. I think Bokniak probably would have been able to do that. Yeah. Also, yeah, I just don't think he's going to find himself being comfortable, like being a, a slickster in this fight. He's going to be, yeah, getting jabbed. And, uh, and also, he's just going to be getting jabbed by someone who looks really freaky. Yeah, he's he's not going to enjoy um like he's not going to find himself like feeling like he's he's being slick, right? Because Sean Woodson looks like a big weirdo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's my my uh <laughs> extremely considered technical opinion. <laughs> uh, it should be a good one. Interesting fight. Probably one of the best ones on the card. Um, if, if, if only, you know, it's, it's my favorite. I'll say that much. Okay. Well, we don't really have to hit anything else, but if you want to, uh, make a sort of completely unconsidered pick for Tanner Bozik versus Leila Latifi and Francisco Trinaldo versus Muslim Salikov, but both really weird in different ways. Mm. Um, I'm taking Bozer over Latifi. Really? Yeah. I, I actually didn't think Latifi looked that bad. Um, against Derek Lewis. Like at the very least, he came in for his first heavyweight fight and sort of counterintuitively said, uh, I'm going to do way more wrestling than I did for a while yep. at light heavyweight. Good idea. Um, I think that could absolutely be the thing to work against Tanner Bozer, except that Tanner Bozer is like fast and agile. He's not Derek Lewis. So like I still think I still think Latifi has a there's a hitch in the process of getting to the takedowns that I he's literally never figured out. I mean, Phil, you and I with with Zane just watched Latifi versus Tony Lopez. Mm-hmm. And, and he's like pretty much the same guy. He doesn't cringe quite as much when fighting, but he really hasn't gotten that much more comfortable in any phase of the game that isn't wrestling, and he also hasn't really gotten more comfortable in um wrestling after the four minute mark. So I'm taking Bozer. You disagree? Uh like a, a three round fight. Uh no, I think I'm gonna take Latifi. Yeah, that's that's true. Um I think this was one of the things I was I was worried about with Bozer when people were sort of marginally excited with him when he came to the UFC is that this is he's just a kind of the kind of guy that you get Looks like he's a he's a functional uh, he's a he's a functional fighter with a, a a well thought out game like Sakai or like at light heavyweight um, uh, Omi Lanchuk mm-hmm. and you realize yeah yeah he has to be that guy because he's just you know physically not up to par and they, they always kind of get exposed and he he did sort of get exposed by. True. Old Andre Olovsky. It's true. And uh, Ilya Latifi was shockingly close to winning that fight against Derek Lewis. Yeah. Uh, fighting, you know, 
fighting the fight which um, Curtis Blades got knocked out trying. True. Um, he did it with more so, confidence, yeah, or at least to just charge Bowser and get like at least two rounds worth of takedowns. If not, getting the like classic Latifi giant right hand because they they become scared of the takedown or weird choke because they try and get up from the takedown. <laughs> Probably uh, his, his two classic finishes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take Latifi. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I just I love the way Latifi submits people. By the way, oh yeah, there is no there's, there's something very like <laughs> it's just very satisfying just watching a it's a huge blocky muscle man choke people. Yeah. It's like watching a guy like open a tin can with his hands or something. It's mm, like, yeah, there's, there's a, a big kind of uh, turn of the century strongman vibe to it. <laughs> so roll up, roll up. You're, what you're saying is Latifi is going to toss Tanner Bowes around like a sort of large triangular weight. Yeah. Um, okay. What about Trinaldo Salikov? Just a just a quick a, a quick explanation and pick. Weird fight. Uh, Trinaldo is going to out wrestle him. <laughs> that would be really funny. I know. I'm totally going to pick it. Really? Yeah. I guess he did get out wrestled by Alex Garcia, and has just basically been fed strikers since then. Is Trinaldo really that good of a wrestler? Who's the last person? He's he all right. Who's the last person he out wrestled? Uh, like Paul Felder. I guess. Uh, you're right. You're right. Maybe it's too it's too much to expect lightweights to out wrestle welterweights. Maybe he'll just get sucked into another boring striking match like uh, ZDS did. That's the thing. I feel that Salikov knocks people out when they try to have a boring striking match with him. Um, well, I guess you know, as you just said, ZDS survived and won. But t- it's, it's it's also it's like just as likely that. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I don't know. I don't really have a strong feeling, actually. I shouldn't have even brought it up. I'm going to pick Trinaldo because I like him more. Um, and maybe yeah, I'm going to do it too. <laughs> maybe he'll do the wrestling. <laughs> It'll be funny. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, that's it for this week's Heavy Hands. Certainly our most serious and <laughs> our most serious and earnest discussion of MMA yet. But never fear, folks. Um, because after this card, we have like an actual good one, right? Right? Please tell mm-hmm. me I'm not wrong. Yes, it is a good one. It's the pay-per-view. It's got, uh, Adesanya versus Vittori 2. Not necessarily the, uh, middleweight fight I was craving, but, uh, fine. I'll take it. Um, Davis and Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno 2. Exactly the flyweight fight I was craving. Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz. Weird, but fine. Whatever. You know? It's, uh, it's got a lot of stuff happening on it. And I'll say this much, folks. You look at the Wikipedia page for this card, it's blue all the way down. That's, that's really one of the laziest but most reliable indications of card quality. So, we'll be back next Part week. from Faraz Ziam and Luigi Vendramini. Well, they had to have that one. That really fills yeah, it up. Yeah, I mean, that those guys are going to be lighting the... <laughs> world on fire anytime soon that rounds the whole card out um so we'll be talking to you about that next week uh looking forward to that one thank you all very much for listening just before we go make sure you find phil on the twitter he's at evil greg jackson find me i'm at boxing bush and uh check out our patreon hopefully by now there will have been uploaded the Hagler commentary episode so um go look at that and enjoy it um and that's it. Thanks for listening, guys. If you came here today for the finer points of face bunch, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. In mono. <laughs>